Welcome to season 10 of the Masterclass series sponsored by Miami-Dade County. My name is Dan Gretsch. I'm the CEO and founder of BizHack Academy and the host of this uh, award-winning Masterclass series. Today, we're going to be talking about the entrepreneurial mindset with the amazing Colin C. Campbell. I got to say, I'm really excited about this topic. It's one of the topics that um, I feel like is um, present in entrepreneurship, yet rarely spoken explicitly about. Um, we're calling it the roller coaster of entrepreneurship. So um, before we before we get to that, oops, uh, let me get back to here. Um, before we get to that, I, I did want to uh, invite you guys to take a quick survey. Um, we're polling folks uh, to talk about two upcoming training opportunities. Um, the first is uh, Miami-Dade County, uh, who's the sponsor of these master classes, uh, has also very generously um, uh, given us a set of 35 scholarships to defray the majority of the cost of our signature social media advertising course called the Digital Marketer's Edge. Last year, we, we had the same thing. Uh, these, uh, I'm going to go ahead and launch the poll. Um, these uh, scholarships, we ran out in three weeks. Uh, we've already gone through half of the scholarships since we announced them last week. We're definitely going to sell out. So um, if you're based in Miami-Dade County, you or your business, uh, and you're interested in the scholarship, which is $3,000, it leaves a $500 commitment fee that also defrays the cost of three one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions. Um, you should definitely let us know if you want more info, and we will uh, share that information with you. In addition to that, um, BizHack has, is going to be focusing uh, all of our uh, efforts in 2024 uh, on finding other partnerships like the one we have with Miami-Dade County. Um, and the type of groups that we partner with are what are known as business support organizations or BSOs. Um, their BSOs can take a lot of forms. Um, they can be like Entrepreneurs Organization or EO, which Colin Campbell and I are a part of. They can be the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Business Alumni Group. They can be a Chamber of Commerce. They could be a accelerator program at a university. Um, anybody who does training or small business support, Chambers of Commerce, um, anyone whose mission is dedicated to helping small businesses survive and thrive, uh, that's who we'd like to partner with. Basically, our business model is we get them to pay for the training so you can have it for free. Now, why do we do it that way? Because you guys are really limited in time money. Um, and so we don't really want you to have to pay for this stuff, but we do want it to change your life. Um, so if we partner with the right organizations, like Miami-Dade County has been a great partner to us, we can really do a lot. So thank you guys in advance for the willingness to introduce us to some of these BSOs. También, uh, todo lo que hago, hagamos está en español también. Hablo español perfectamente y casi todos mis uh, entrenadores son bilingües, uh, which was just to say that I am bilingual and so are my trainers. So uh, training in Spanish is a big part of what we do. Thank you in advance for the introductions. So I wanted to first acknowledge our amazing funder, Miami-Dade County, and the office of the mayor, Daniela Levine Cava. Um, they have three different initiatives that uh, are part of this uh, and are great training resources for all of you. Number one is they uh, have an overall initiative to get small businesses and other professionals future ready. And so training is a really big part of that. Number two, they have a small business initiative called Strive 305. And you should absolutely go to the Miami-Dade Strive 305 website. They give out free courses, including five different courses in three languages that we offer. But there's dozens of other courses on things like QuickBooks and other topics. Absolutely uh, worth your time. And then finally, the Miami-Dade Public Library System, which is one of the great resor resources in our community. Incredible amounts of free materials, uh, including streaming services for music and video. Uh, you know, you don't need to be paying Netflix. You can use the Public Library System to get a similar version. Uh, same thing with Spotify. Um, our media sponsor is South Florida PBS. Many of you may know this, but I had a 20-year career in public media. I worked at, at PBS Nightly Business Report. I also worked at NPR and Marketplace. Very honored to have them as a media sponsor. And then um, a lot of you guys are here through our community partners. Our community partners are the more than two dozen local organizations who have helped promote 
these uh, tra free trainings to their members, and we're very grateful to you. I wanted to just uh, say again, uh, welcome. I'm the host of this masterclass series. Uh, I'm a two-decade journalist uh, turned trainer, uh, business owner, entrepreneur. Um, the, what we train in is marketing uh, in all its forms. These masterclasses are really focused on business strategy. And so we've brought in guest instructors who can talk about uh, the essential uh, components of business strategy. Today, we're going to be talking to uh, an author who just wrote a book that's uh, been for multiple weeks now a mul an Amazon bestseller um, about uh, the different phases uh, of entrepreneurship. Uh, the book is called Start, Scale, Exit, Repeat. Um, Colin, if you could put a link to where people can learn more about it and buy the book, please. Um, it, it has my highest recommendation. Colin is, uh, as you'll find, uh, a kind of entrepreneur practitioner. He's a guy who uh, learned it by doing it, by exiting multiple companies. Um, and he's going to talk about the the mental, the mentality required to do that and some of the toll mentally that it takes. Um, this masterclass series has gotten a lot of re recognition for the service that we're providing. Uh, we've won four national awards now for it. I'm very proud of that. It's very important work we're doing here. Um, and um, I just found out that uh, on Tuesday, I'm going to be testifying in front of Congress uh, at the House Committee on Small Business to talk about the work we're doing with small businesses to train you all up, uh, get you future ready, and specifically teach you AI tools to help you get there. So um, none of this would be possible without you. I feel a little bit like Taylor Swift on the Eras Tour thanking her fans. But the truth of the matter is if you don't show up, there's no biz hack. So thank you guys for voting with your feet, uh, being here week after week um, and, uh, you know, supporting this effort. You know, I feel every time I come into one of these, I get pumped up because I'm like, oh, my God, this is like what I'm here to do. Uh, you know, I was born to do this. Uh, and it's really uh, very rewarding uh, to, to be here serving you. Um, and so with that, let's go get started. Today. Today, we're going to be talking about the roller coaster of entrepreneurship as part of our unit on the entrepreneurial mindset. Our instructor is Colin C. Campbell, multiple serial entrepreneur and author of Start, Scale, Exit, Repeat, an Amazon bestselling book about the four phases of entrepreneurship. I'm your host, Dan Gretsch, the founder and CEO of BizHack Academy. So I wanted to start a little bit differently today with a personal reflection about my personal entrepreneurial mindset journey. Today is going to be a really different kind of session. Um, it's going to be a lot more about uh, the mindset of entrepreneurship and some of the challenges that many of us face uh, on that journey. So I wanted to talk about how this topic came to mean so much to me. Um, and I just wanted to give you a little bit of background. My wife, is a clinical social worker, which means basically she's a therapist. Um, and so she has studied uh, how to be a therapist and I've learned a lot uh, just being married to her. And then when I was a journalist, um, one of the topics that I was particularly passionate about was trauma and journalism. Uh, like most journalists, I covered a lot of misery, poverty. I I uh, spent a lot of time on the border between Guatemala and Mexico and between Mexico and the United States. And I've covered uh, extreme poverty in Latin America and, you know, in Miami as well. Miami is one of the poorest big cities in the in the United States. And so um, I always worried a little bit that um, I might be traumatizing with my journalism already traumatized people. And so I did a, a fellowship at Columbia University at their journalism school, specifically related to journalism and trauma. And then for many years became very active in the psycho psychology community. I was even a board member of the American Psychological Association Trauma Division. And I spent several years there, uh, the first ever journalist to be a board member. So that's all prior to me, um, uh, 10 years ago, losing my job as a journalist and reinventing myself as an entrepreneur. Uh, but that orientation towards psychology and mindset uh, has never left me. And so 
Um, fast forward to 2019, and I was taking a wonderful training program um, called the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Business Training Program. It, for those of you who've never heard of it, uh, absolutely uh, highest recommendation. It's free if you're lucky enough to get selected for it. Um, you need to have uh, $75,000 in annual revenue and a couple years in business. Um, and it is a training curriculum designed by Babson College. And Babson College they talk about three elements of every business, the market, your business, and you. And that end you part, I had never heard talked about before explicitly, but they said, look, every small business must fit its owner. And I was so inspired by that. We started to use the phrase at BizHack, one size fits one for the work that we do. And we even went and trademarked that phrase. So I actually own the trademark on one size fits one. And the idea is that there are two key skills or there are two key things that you need to be successful as an entrepreneur. You need the right skills and you need the right mindset. They called that in the Babson program, skill set and mindset. Skill set is what are the technical skills that you need to operate, market, sell uh, on behalf of your business? Mindset is how do you approach that work so that you aren't terrorizing your staff, that you're treating your employees and your clients fairly, that you're forging long-term partnerships, and that you're not um, you know, driving yourself crazy and your family in the process. And, and that mindset piece, I never really heard spoken about explicitly, that fits you mindset. All that was introduced to me in the Goldman Sachs program, and in many ways, was a precursor of today's session, which is focused entirely on mindset. During COVID, I did an incredible workshop called the Why Workshop. It was based off the book and the work of Simon Sinek. Uh, many of you have seen his book, Start With Why. Even more of you have seen his TED Talk on the same. And the idea is identifying why you do what you do is a really incredibly powerful precursor to, to great leadership. And it was during that why workshop, the why I do what I do, that I realized that my why is that I champion the underdog so they can transform their lives. And that this why was actually something I inherited from my mother, who was an inner city art school teacher and in the public uh, schools of Philadelphia. Um, and understanding my why uh, has been transformative in terms of finding meaning and being resilient in my work, but it's also... Um, helped me coach the why out of many other people. And that's become one of my signatures is what we call the business story or the story of me. Why do you do what you do? What is the per intensely personal reason that you care about the business you run so much that you're willing to sacrifice so much for it? The next big breakthrough was from a book called Rocket Fuel by Gina Wickman and Mark Winters. And in that book, they talk about this incredible mixture um, of two types uh, of uh, roles in a company, the visionary and the integrator. The visionary is usually the founder. Often they have, you know, a million ideas swirling around their head, a thousand good, I a thousand good ideas, you know, 10 of which are actually going to make them money. The other uh, 990, which are going to distract everybody and keep them off, off their game. Um, you know, they have more ideas before breakfast than most people have in a lifetime. That is a classic visionary. And they need to be paired with a really strong operator who's like going to get execute on that vision. Um, or the, they it's very hard for them to be successful uh, as a business owner. And that's what rocket fuel is, is that visionary integrator combo. Now, when you think about Silicon Valley, you would often hear that the great um partnership that you're looking for when you're founding a company is the tech person and the business person. More recently with Airbnb, you'll hear it's the human-centered design person and the business person. Well, for most small businesses, what you really need is the visionary and the integrator. And the book Rocket Fuel, which is part of the Traction series, Entrepreneurial Operating System, we did a whole masterclass uh, about that topic already, is where this idea was introduced to me. And I got to say, like when I read that book, um, a little bit over two and a half years ago, it was like the shock of recognition. Like I was reading the book and I'm like, oh my God, I'm such a visionary. And then my coach at 10KSB, Marcy Rosenbaum said, hey, Dan, you do realize that to be a visionary is actually a diagnosis. 
And I said, what do you mean, Marcy? She said, look, most visionaries have ADHD, they're bipolar, they, you know, they, it's more of a diagnosis than a role. Uh, and you just need to surround yourself by people who allow that to be a asset rather than a liability. I'm like, oh, okay. I uh, never thought about it. Um, it's not framed that way in the book at all. And not all visionaries have ADHD, but as you'll see today, a lot of us do. <laughs> And then finally, um, the, the the story of me, the concept of, of the story of me, the, the deep rooted reason why you do what you do, which is what I work with so many business owners to, to, to unearth and coach out of you. Um, one of the things that Gino Wickman, the author of the Traction book series and Rocket Fuel said on a podcast once, is that most businesses are built on a foundation of trauma. And boy, that set off alarm bells in my head because I had spent a whole part of my career studying the intersection between journalism and trauma. Now I suddenly realized, oh my God, I need to start studying the intersection of business and trauma. And, and what do they mean by businesses are built on the foundation of trauma? Simple. 10 years ago, I was fired from my job as news director of the local NPR station. And that set me on a new on a journey that has that ended with me starting BizHack, a training academy for small businesses. When I first started BizHack, I used to always tell my story of me was the story of starting BizHack because I had been fired and I needed to reinvent myself. And I reinvented myself first as a PR person, then as a marketer, then as an educator, and now as a business owner. Um, and that's a very compelling story. That's a story that a lot of people really resonated with. They re like a lot of us have been fired in our lifetimes and a lot of people, you know, it, it was a humiliating and humbling moment for me. It was my worst professional moment, one of my worst moments, period. Um, and that's the trauma that led to BizHack. And so many of us share a trauma story that relates to why we founded our, found our company. Uh, and, and part of the reason why is because it's a little crazy to start your own company. Um, usually you don't do it because you have tons of high priced offers to work, you know, for tens, hundreds of thousands of dollars for another company. Often you're doing it out of a place of need uh, and maybe even desperation. And so many of us started the company uh, and, and, and built it on a foundation of trauma. But what I found over time is that the company was about so much more for me than the worst moment in my professional life getting fired. It was, it, and it was not just simply like a job I gave myself, but it had become a, a passion. Um, and that's when I started to talk more about my mom and my grandfather, my grandparents, uh, my two granddads and, and how they inspired me to be a coach and, and, and teacher. Um, and, and that's really how I got to where I am today. So though I started on a foundation of trauma, that's what like compelled me to take the entrepreneurial leap, I've kind of overcome that um, and, and made it more a, a generative story of purpose. Um, th and that, that journey uh, that I just shared um, has been very much about understanding myself. Now, I do not have ADHD, um, but I definitely on the spectrum uh, of of it, uh, I've actually met with a psychologist, and um, I am not quote diagnosable. However, he said something to me that was very helpful, which is he said, "Dan, you have a very particular personality, and personality is locked in. There's not a lot you can do about it. It's one of your best traits, and it's also the one that gets you in a lot of trouble sometimes. So, what your job is is to see yourself coming." to see yourself coming. What does that mean? That means I need to know where my neurodiversity, neurodiversity is just the term that means my unique personality can cause me problems, like getting fired, because that was definitely a contributor to it. Uh, there is nothing, uh, there's no there there, no financial malfeasance, no um, no inappropriate behavior towards coworkers. It was 100% personality driven, but I honestly did deserve to get fired. Um, and it was a very rough lesson. It really messed up my life and career for quite a while, but it did teach me. And for this, I'm grateful that if I don't attend to my extreme personality, uh, I'm going to continue to derail myself and undo a lot of the hard work that I've done.
And so one of the things that I've done, and I encourage you guys to take a screenshot of this, uh, we'll also be sharing this in the follow-up, um, is these are the seven different assessments that I have taken to help understand better who I am as a person, how I communicate, uh, how I think, what my personality is. And each of these has different strengths and weaknesses um, and have helped give me insight uh, into who I am so that I can build a business that fits me and so I can hire people who allow me to accentuate my strengths without allowing my weaknesses to derail my company. Because one promise I made myself after I got fired is this, never again. Not that I'll never get fired again. I can't promise that. But I promise myself that I will never allow my personalities, extreme, the extremities of my personality to get in the way of my career. I'm going to do the work to understand myself and see myself coming. And that is the, the, the prelude to today's presentation, which is uh, with the uh, amazing Colin Campbell. We wanted to share with you first some statistics about entrepreneurship and mental health because the statistics are quite extreme and, and you'll see that uh, you'll understand now what we mean when we say that to be a visionary entrepreneur is a diagnosis. So first of all, some of the greatest entrepreneurs in the history uh, of our country uh, have, a, have, have uh, publicly acknowledged that they have ADHD. Probably the most uh, prominent uh, of those is Richard Branson, who has spoken extensively uh, about uh, his condition and how uh, he's used it to help him be, uh, you know, one of the great uh, innovators with his virgin uh, empire. Uh, Walt Disney, obviously, the uh, with his brother, uh, who was the integrator, by the way. So Walt was the visionary and his brother was the integrator. And they created, of course, the, the empire that is Disney. And then Bill Gates, you know, creator of Microsoft and the Gates Foundation, uh, has also said publicly that he had uh, uh, has ADHD. Um, there is a researcher named Michael A. Freeman, who's a professor of psychiatry at UC San Francisco, who has made the study of entrepreneurial mental health his exclusive focus professionally. And he's founder of a company called Econa, Econa, which is dedicated to studying the mental health and needs of founders. Um, they offer evidence-based workshops and peer support groups. They co-create programs with founder communities globally, and they support academic research on entrepreneur-centric mental health wellness solutions. This is an amazing resource for all of us. Um, and he, uh, you know, any of the research that Michael Freeman puts out is, is really uh, data-based and, 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 and research-backed. So let me share some of, the, some of his findings. Uh, he says that entrepreneurs are, quote, touched with fire. 30% of us have a lifetime history of depression. 29% of us have an ADHD diagnosis which based on my research is six times the general population. 12% of us have substance use conditions, which is basically we have a kind of a, 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 an inclination towards abuse uh, and, uh, and addiction. And one of the things we're going to talk about today is we're going to ask the question, is entrepreneurship an addiction? And then 11% uh, of us are bipolar, which is 12 times the general population. So in a real way, yes, to be a visionary entrepreneur is a diagnosis. 49%, nearly half of entrepreneurs report having a personal mental health history. That's according to a Michael Freeman study. But it's not just Michael Freeman. Research by the international health insurer Bupa Global said that 64% of business leaders have suffered from mental conditions, including anxiety, stress, and depression. And a, sort, a study by Valerie Sutherland at the University of Manchester in England said that one quarter or 25% of chief executives age 50 or younger experience higher than average levels of depression and anxiety. There was a quote in the Michael Freeman study uh, 
which really caught my attention, which is entrepreneurship addiction. The compulsion to create and grow new ventures has been compared to other behavioral addictions such as workaholism and internet misuse. And what's interesting is that's kind of a perfect introduction to, to Colin C. Campbell, because Colin is, per, you know, I would say a man who has been addicted to uh, entrepreneurship, sometimes a great personal to toll. And so the goal of today's conversation is to really have a conversation with a serial entrepreneur who's written a book about serial entrepreneurship, Start, Scale, Exit, Repeat, an Amazon bestseller, and ask him about the mindset required for each of those um, phases in business life and um, what is required from a mindset perspective uh, to make it through those uh, periods and, and, and the toll that can potentially ca cause for you personally and family and ways in which you can avoid it. Um, he has successfully started, scaled, and exited more than a dozen companies. Um, and those companies are include Two Cows, uh, Hostopia, and the Dop Club's domain. He managed that domain. He also operates Startup.club, which was a clubhouse. Back when Clubhouse like was really a big thing uh, during COVID, they were able to grow their clubhouse room to more than a million members. Uh, and now they have uh, still regular talks on Clubhouse uh, that are syndicated on podcasts networks. And the mission of Startup Club is just to make it easier for everyone in the startup ecosystem to find, connect, learn, and grow together. So, you know, Colin has, a, you know, in addition to being a serial entrepreneur, um, he's very focused on giving back. Uh, really excited uh, to have you here today, Colin. And um, without further ado, Colin C. Well, thank you for having me on. And that was quite a background of information to really understand what it is that we all go through. And I think the the first message is that you're not alone. It takes a village to raise a startup. And there's a lot of resources like your BizHack Academy. Uh, there are a lot of incubators out there, even if you're not in South Florida. If you just look on the internet on Google and search for incubators, uh, uh, your local college, university, uh, you can find a number of resources that can help you. So I think that's the the first, sort of first message that popped out here. Uh, Dan, I, I want to like step back and go back here and sort of explain why this book became a book. I was asked to speak at MIT in 2012. And uh, it was uh, a gentleman who runs uh, the Masters of Entrepreneurship program, Vern Harnish, and uh, another gentleman, Patrick Thien, was his business partner at the time. And they asked me to, to speak on the topic of how to start, scale, exit, repeat, and how is it that you were so successful at doing that over and over again? And we began to unpack a number of patterns. So for the last 10 years... From that time of that speech, uh, we've been working on this book. In the last two years, we interviewed over 200 people, 50 of which are in the book, all to try to crack the code of what does it take to start, scale, exit, repeat? What is the secret code? Now, it's interesting that when we first met, you had read the book and you brought up a thesis. And your thesis was that this particular book goes into not just the formula of starting, scaling, and exiting, but also the emotional components, the emotional challenges. And I didn't even realize that. It was almost like you had pointed that out to me. And I thought that was fascinating that you were able to see something that I wasn't seeing. I was thinking about, okay, what's it take to succeed? Yeah, you got to deal with this over here. You got to deal with the, the the sense of potential failure, embarrassment, whatever it is when you're starting a business, or the loss of identity when you're selling a company. Yeah, you've got to deal with these things. But for me, I was focused on the formula of what it takes to start, scale, exit, repeat. So I think this has been useful for me to really self-reflect and think about, well, if you really want to be successful, then you have to address 
who you are. You have to address the stress. You have to address the roller coaster. And so we break that down from start, scale, exit, repeat. I love that. Yeah, I mean, one of the things is it was very obvious to me when I read the book that there was this hidden through line about mindset. And I've been looking for you for a long time. In other words, I've done um, like 100 uh, plus master classes now, and I've never actually tackled this topic straightforwardly uh, head on like this. Um, and the reason why is because it's really just not written about in the literature. Um, but yet, you know, Gino Wickman said, you know, uh, businesses are built on a foundation of trauma. Yet the mere articulation of a visionary is really someone who has ADHD or manic or, or is bipolar. Um, it's It's like there. And the more you look for it, the more you'll see it. And so when I finally found like my thought partner, uh, I, I grabbed at it and I said, like, look, Colin, um, you're, and I remember you resisted me at first. You're like, this is not what the book is about. But, you know, when I first saw you present uh, at the EO Nerve conference, the, the very first thing you did is you read from the back of the book, from the last chapter, where you talk explicitly about Michael Freeman and these statistics. Like of all the things that you chose to talk about, that's where you chose to talk about in that presentation. And that's when I knew I had my guy. And um, over the course of the last month, we've been working together in a journey of mutual discovery because like I've never really spoken about this publicly. There, there's a lot um, of stigma attached to mentality and mental health issues. Um, and so I'd really love for you to now take us through um, kind of the different stages and the mindset required for each. But I did want to just do one more kind of framing up of it. There's two types uh, of ways of thinking about mental health when it comes to entrepreneurship. The way it's most often talked about is the mental and emotional toll that being an entrepreneur takes on an individual and their family, right? And that's really legit. Like it is a very spiky emotional journey. And any of us who've ever faced down the prospect of not being able to make payroll know how brutalizing it can be on your psyche. But there's another type of conversation around mental health that isn't talked about nearly as much, which is that many of us are neurodivergent and that's why we started our business. In other words, many of us have ADHD and couldn't do well in school. Many of us didn't finish college. Many of us, um, like Einstein, who was said to have ADHD, like you know, Mark Zuckerberg, dropped out of school and started our businesses. And for many of us, we're unemployable, right? No one would ever want to hire us. And so we, the only person who would hire us is ourselves. And, and, and that's the point that I don't see talked about as much. Only really Michael Freeman seems to talk about that, which is in some ways to be neurodivergent is a precondition of entrepreneurship. And one of the reasons why is because it actually doesn't make sense to start a business. Why doesn't it make sense? 96% of businesses never make it to a million dollars. And if you're not at a million dollars, you're essentially a subsistence business. Because if you're making 20% margins, you know, most of us could make a lot more money being hired in the free market by somebody than we can make if we're in a sub-million dollar business. And 96% of us never get there. Right. More than half of small businesses, I don't know the exact number, fail within 10 years. The failure rate of small business and anyone who has entrepreneurs in their family knows it's a highly risky, very high likelihood to fail type activity. And yet we do it anyway, even if we know the statistics. And oftentimes when we fail, what do we do, Colin? We do it again. Right. That's right. So, so the point is that we're kind of crazy. Like in a good way, we're like crazy risk takers who are willing to bet on ourselves in a way that on paper, nobody would or should do. And so then the question becomes, why are we willing to make that bet when everyone in our life is telling us, no, that's not a good idea. Why don't you just go get a job? And we're like, no, no, I have this idea. I got to do it. Or some of us just feel compelled to. And so what I really wanted to do is uh, I, I would like to you know, begin to have uh, a better conversation 
uh, in the entrepreneurial uh, community uh, about the fact that um, mental health should not be stigmatized in part because if you can see yourself coming, those things that make you an extraordinary entrepreneur are also the ones that can derail your company if you don't manage them properly. Um, and one of my favorite examples before I hand it back over to you to talk about the scale mentality, the start mentality um, is, uh, and the start mindset, the mindset during the start phase is um, there is a really uh, innovative entrepreneur uh, who um, created the company Harrow, help a reporter out. And he talked about having severe ADHD, which um, really limited um, his ability uh, to, um, uh, you know, run his, to, to like go to school company. His name is Peter Shankman, by the way, Peter Shankman. Um, and Peter Shankman talked about how uh, he struggled a lot in school. He, 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 he couldn't sit still. He had severe ADHD. And for most of his life, he was taught that this was like a real um, uh, problem. And uh, he came to realize that this was actually not a problem. He had a brain that thought faster than other people. Um, and and, and that in, a, in a sense, ADHD is just a fast brain, a brain that kind of gets ahead of your mouth, a brain that gets ahead of your body, a brain that has, gets ahead of people you're with, but you have a supercharged brain. And so he uh, began to see his ADHD as a benefit. And uh, he started to learn ways to manage it. And so one of the things he does uh, is he's written several books, including a children's book, um, is he will jump out of an airplane. And then when he lands, he will get out his laptop and write. Because he his body needs to get that shock of endorphins and adrenaline in order to be able to calm down enough for him to focus on writing. And he will then write for, for seven, eight hours. Very extreme behavior, but that is what his neurodivergence requires of him and he is able to be very productive as a result. Similarly, he will buy a round trip ticket to Asia and never leave the plane. He'll fly to Asia and he'll fly back. Why? Because it forces him to sit down and he will write. And that is how he, as a guy with ADHD who can't sit still, has been able to be a prolific author. So the point is, Peter Shankman has found his ways to see himself coming and come, uh, coming and manage uh, his his neurodivergence in a way that's been very very productive, and he's uh, doing great. So with that, we're going to go over the four um, stages of the entrepreneurial journey, starting with start, and, and we're going to now talk about um, what is the requirement of the mindset and the mindset challenges for someone starting a business. Yeah, and I and I think that we've all been through this. Anyone who started a business has had these issues the fear of failure i remember you talk about oh it's better to get a job and work for somebody else when i was graduating in college all my friends said are you crazy you're starting a business and yet you could get become a lawyer and make one hundred and fifty thousand a year or one hundred twenty thousand dollars a year at the time like yes this is what i wanted to do and the first thing i did actually right out of college may not sound very sexy. I went to work on the family farm. I went to work and hoe and flog vegetables. And, you know, I was able to build up enough money to get to my my first business. Uh, it was about $3,000 uh, from the farming, $12,800 from a loan from my mother, and probably about two to 3000 on credit cards. You know, that's how it started. And believe it or not, the loan from my mother was the thing that scared me the most because I wanted to make certain that whatever I did, that I would pay her back no matter what. It wasn't it wasn't her taking the risk. It was myself taking that risk. But that fear of failure is there, and the statistics show it. You have um, a very high percentage of failures. Uh, Dan already mentioned that. But what we've learned in the research in the book is that you can actually decrease your chances of failure by learning the code, by figuring it out what serial entrepreneurs do 
over and over again. And there was one study in the book that quoted that uh, that you can actually increase your chances by 100%. You can actually succeed more often in a startup by simply understanding a lot of the issues related to startups, okay? It actually goes from about 18% to 36%. So we're not going, we're not saying that even if you know everything and you are perfect, that you're going to succeed here because that's not necessarily the case. But what we can do is increase your chances of success. And when you have success, you learn how to scale that success and then exit it and do that over and over again. And in my career, I've done probably about 25 ventures. I've probably had more than a little more than half of them fail. Uh, the key is to mitigate the loss and focus on the successful companies and scale those. Um, I will say that, let me start with a story. Okay, I'm gonna take you back to the 90s. This was a time uh, where the internet was exploding. My brother and I launched a company called Internet Direct. It became a publicly traded company. It, it was actually acknowledged as the fastest growing company in Canada. Number one, we're, we're on front page of magazines up there in Canada. And uh, we decided to merge with a cable company and apply for a wireless license. Now, we were publicly traded at the time. And I was 28 years old, and I had about 13% of the company in 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 uh, in stock. And we merged the company. We applied for a wireless wireless license, and we won the license. The stock, which was trading at about 80 million dollars on the day we announced the merger, uh, ended up trading at over one billion dollars. Okay, 28, 29 years old. This is insane. Now, I had agreed to do a lockup. My brother and I and the company had agreed to do a lockup of our shares for 18 months, but nothing could go wrong. This was 1999, right? And of course, fast forward to March of 2000, a judge announces that they're going to break up Microsoft and the NASDAQ goes from 5,000 to 4,000. We pull a $50 million offering on the stock market thinking the market's going to come back. And it didn't. Of course, if you remember that time, it was the dot-com crash. The music had stopped. And the stock that was trading at $19 a share one day, I ended up selling. And the staff and the people around me ended up selling for $0.06 cents a share. It was an absolutely brutal wipeout, public disgrace. It was horrible because not only I had lost all about 95% of my wealth at the time, but all the employees around me and the investors. Uh, and just to be like, I, I was driving through a McDonald's and somebody said, oh, I saw you on the news last night. Yeah, yeah. Just give me this. Just give me the <laughs> that time I was ordering muffins and hot chocolate on the way to work. But anyway, um, you know, it's that kind of stuff that happened. And you know, I I looked at that failure and I learned two things. One, bad things do happen, which, by the way, is the thesis for the book. Start, scale, exit, take some money off the table, repeat, all right? Um, and also that, you know, liquidity or control, believe in yourself. The, the fact of the matter is we believed in these executives from this cable company, and we believed that they could operate this business in a better way. And we were 28 years old. What do we really know? Right. So I learned that we needed to believe in ourselves. So we, again, what do we do? We dusted ourselves off. We picked ourselves up and we started a new business. That business, we went public in 2006. We sold it in 2008 to a Fortune 500 company. And that deal, I'm proud to say, was all cash. Uh, we never look back. Uh, and I've learned that it's liquidity or control. That's one of the chapters in the book because we really want to make certain that we are the ones in control. We've been successful at what we've done. We've got to believe in ourselves. And when we believe in ourselves, we can achieve great things. When we hand it over to others, at that point, we either get liquidity or control. We either have control of the company 
or we have liquidity. But once we don't want to be handing our company over to someone and let them and risk the, our future in their hands. And that's what happened during that. I will say this. Failures are the scars of your past that guide us through our new ventures. And to be quite frank, I learned from that. And never again have I gone down that path. And since then, we've started, scaled, and exited a number of different companies over the last 20 years. So I want to share that failure of a 28-year-old losing $100 million. Because it really, truly shows that we can learn, but we don't have to learn by losing $100 million ourselves. We can simply learn from others. And entrepreneurship, I call it a trade. It's a trade like any other trade that we need to learn to master. And when we do that, we can continue to succeed over and over again. But part of that mastery is our emotions and what we go through. So if you could put up the slide, Dan, so it's again, so I want to talk a, li a little bit, the next slide, sorry. Um, yeah, I want to talk a little bit about this tension that exists when you start your business. You have a lot of yaysayers and naysayers. Your mom, for instance, is likely a yaysayer. Your friends, many of them are naysayers. We want to be in a, in, a, in a particular mode of not being under attack during our startup. So I want you to think about a game, uh, the, the old driving car driving game. We used to put 25 cents in a, into a machine and, and you'd play it. And then at a certain point, you get extended time. And if you, if you made it through the gate, you get extended time. So what I often do with the cohorts or with the, individuals who are in the uh, classes that I've taught is I, I get them to come up with a stage gate, a smart stage gate, specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time bound. Okay. It could be, I will have an MVP on December 31st. It could be, I will have my first hundred distributors. It could be I will have my first thousand customers. Whatever that is, I want you to try to set that point in time. Now you have the freedom. And now you can say to the naysayers, and you can say to those around you, look, I've set a goal. I'm going to try to hit my goal. I know it's not going to be all perfect. There's going to be a roller coaster. We're going to go up and down, but I'm going to try to hit my goal. And I need the room to be able to achieve that. And so we do a, this, this thing we call a four sticky note business plan. And we put the stage gate on the, on the first sticky note. And then we say, okay, how much money do I need? How much, how many, what are the resources, the people we need? And what are the KPIs I need to hit that first stage gate? So that's the first thing. Give yourself the room to try. Give yourself the, uh, the uh, ability and the time you need to be able to get to your first stage gate. When you hit that first stage gate, great. Then you're going to raise additional funding. You're going to hire additional staff. You're going to try to think about your next stage gate. If you don't hit your stage gate at that point in time, then it's time to either pivot or kill it. Let me give you an example. I was working on a company a few years back called Shareholder Blockchain. And in this particular company, I uh, hired a law, a lawyer and a, a lead programmer who would hire other programmers. Uh, I gave them $50,000 and I said, okay, guys, I need an MVP by September 30th. And the concept was a share registry for private companies that were held on a blockchain. I thought the idea was cool, really cool. And I still think the idea is amazing. I set them out on that and they came back three months later and I shouldn't have waited three months. I should have been checking up on them. Like, I know you're probably saying, uh, look at this guy, right? Um, but the reality is uh, they came back three months later and they had a completely different business plan. Mm -hmm. The whole thing, they did, they were, they completely fell off track. And uh, I said, guys, you missed your first stage gate. 
we're shutting the company down. I shut the company down instantly. So I do think this is a technique you can use when you first start a company to take care of the naysayers uh, and those who are, are a bit negative about why you why are you doing this? Why are you spending this money? Why are you investing this money? Wait, look, guys, I'm doing it. I'm going to get it to this stage. If I can get it to the stage, I have succeeded. I've succeeded at getting to this stage. Now you've got challenges post the stage gate. We got to go raise money now. We got to go do additional things. But uh, that's that's but that but you know what can help you with that? The incubators. Uh, there's a couple of I'm going to share a, a couple. Of I want to uh, put a hold on that. We'll talk about the incubators yep. in a sec. But I want to dig in a little bit to this. Um, so first of all, this stage gate metaphor is beautiful. It's like you're. Um, you know, I'm in Flanagan's and my son loves taking the little motorcycle. Um, and, uh, you know, every time you go through the stage gate, it gives you 30 more seconds, a, a minute more, and you get to continue playing the okay. game. Yeah. But right. Uh, it's a beautiful metaphor. Now, back in when I was um, in leadership training, um, they talked about a, a similar uh, concept, which was called phases and gates. Um, and they basically said, uh, you're in you know, phase one, and then you hit a gate. And the gate is like a stoplight, red, yellow, green. Um, and at the end of the phase, you either stop, kill it, you yellow, pivot, or you green, you move on through to the next phase. And so this concept of phases and gates or stage gates uh, is an essential um, uh, mindset because it gives you permission to ignore the naysayers and it allows you to not get swayed by the yay sayers, the yes sayers. And I wanted to ask you about this. So I'm going to describe to you a situation that's pretty common in entrepreneurship. An entrepreneur has an idea and they are on fire. They're touched with fire by this idea. And everyone in their life is like, you're crazy. And you hear all of these in, inspirational speakers. Like I was listening to a guy who's given a million shoes to people in Africa. And everybody in his life was like, you are crazy. That is a crazy thing to do. And he's like, no, I'm going to do it. And, um, you know, <laughs> sometimes they do it. And then they have like books they write and they go on speaking tours and they've made for television movies about them. But I sometimes think about the like 999 other people who had that crazy idea and didn't make it, you know, and many of us know like failed entrepreneurs, like perennially failed entrepreneurs, like ruined entrepreneurs in our lives. And so I do wonder as a guy who's like started a lot of businesses and had more than half of them fail and who's experienced it, um, failure at a, at, a, at a level that almost no one I know and certainly me personally have never experienced. How do you know? when the naysayers are wrong like how do you know when you're not just being crazy so it's a lot harder when i was younger now i think people just sort of accept it okay this guy's had so many successes that maybe he's right maybe he's got an idea here you know what maybe he this book could actually turn out to be something which by the way is almost like launching another small business you know a lot of us fear the reputational hit we'll get if we fail. Launching a book like this, Start, Scale, Exit, Repeat, literally, I was very fearful of this one because I'm like, this is a public humiliation. I'm going to launch this book, and it's going to do what 99.9% .9 of all other books do. It's even a higher failure rate than, than, than small businesses. It's going to just completely drop off the charts now i don't know why i was so fearful i'm still fearful today that you know that it could still drop off but we've hit number one for so many weeks in a row on on, on the charts and i shouldn't be fearful of that but it but it's real and we all have to acknowledge that public yeah, humiliation I heard, I heard. is part of every startup everybody around you oh i told you so i told you so but i'll, I'll tell you this we actually at paw.com we have a saying. We say, um, launch and test products fail more 
Like, think about that. We're actually encouraging the team to fail more through launching and testing products. But what we want to do is we want to cut the losers quickly and scale the winners big. Now, at Paw.com, we come out with a product. And it's three years, by the way, on Inc. 5000, fastest growing companies. Okay, three years in a row. And at Paw.com, we come out with a product, completely innovative, brand new. Nothing been out there on the market like this, like the memory foam pup rugs or the memory foam car seats, stuff you've never seen on the market before. You, everybody looks at it and says, well, it's such a successful company. They don't realize that nine out of 10 products actually fail. But you know what? We test 100 products. Doesn't work. We kill that line. We do it again, do it again, do it again. And then all of a sudden we hit one. And guess what? We sold over a million products on that of, of that particular, whatever it was. We sold hundreds of thousands, a million, whatever it is. Because when you hit the winner, that's it. Then you scale. And that's the key. Failure is a learning opportunity. We do need to reframe that. And I do believe the people around us don't understand that as entrepreneurs. Yeah. And I want to talk about, there, I used to do improv comedy for more than a decade. And there was a principle of improv, which was called dare to fail gloriously. <laughs> and the idea was this, you're on stage without a script. And you're inevitably going to fuck up. Inevitably, right? Like it's, it's, it's baked in. So if you're going to fuck up, fuck up big. Make oh, I see. It, make it glorious. Make it a big fuck up. So what it is, is when you fail, you turn it in to a glorious success. And, you know, a great example of this is, you know, when on SNL, they crack. Like the one thing you're not supposed to do is laugh when you're doing a funny scene. But some of the best SNL skits ever are when they crack because they're failing gloriously. They're doing it with such um, joy and with such uh, humanity that suddenly it like cracks that fourth wall and you realize that there's an actor in there who's like trying to just keep their shit together, uh, which is terrible acting, but it's great entertainment. And so that was the idea with, with, with this is like, if you're going to go for it, go for it. Now, <clears throat> Don't lose $100 million. That's not a good idea. But the idea, and I'm actually going through this right now because I'm in a phase right now of I'm in a startup phase of being a thought leader. What, what I mean to say is I'm like trying to elevate Dan Gretsch as a thought leader on business storytelling, artificial intelligence for marketing, and just generally speaking uh, as an advocate on behalf of small businesses. And I can tell you that many of my mentors are like, that's a terrible business. The likelihood of success is one in a hundred. Uh, you know, the path is littered with many people uh, who have not succeeded at doing that. That is not a good business model, et cetera. And it's really like good advice because I'm realizing like, I need to have a good plan B in place so that if it doesn't work out, um, you know, I still have a way to like feed my family. But I'm still going for it, even though I know the likelihood of failure is high, because I believe it's going to happen. And, you know, I'll probably look at this video in 10 years and I'll see myself and I'll be like, yeah, Dan, it didn't really happen for you. But I, one thing I will know is that the 10 year future self will not regret having tried. Hey, Dan, Dan, you've got I'm going to try to break this down a little bit. I'm hearing a lot of self-doubt. This is real. This is real. We all have self-doubt. Right. So what's your stage gate? You're going to need to start thinking like in the terms of that you're going to need to say, OK, my stage gate is I'm going to generate twenty thousand dollars a month in sponsorship. I don't know what it is. Right. But when you hit that stage gate. Then you can if you don't hit it and then by this date, too, we're going to put a date, a time on it before then. No more self-doubt. Let's end that. There's no more self-doubt. This is all about you do it. You have a phenomenal background, a great show it's a it creates a lot of value how do we lean into that and get to your first stage gate we that's that it's that self-doubt that that continually goes through our minds that you were exhibiting here a minute ago that we just want to say okay and i'm going to eliminate the self-doubt until i hit that first stage gate if i don't hit the first stage gate fine i'll pivot or kill it you know, thank you for letting me be vulnerable and, and for sharing that. I think a lot of us, even people like I present as very self-confident, 
but I struggle too, guys. And I just want to be real about that and how powerful it is to have someone like a Colin who can give you a tool like a stage gate to say like, look, Dan, just quiet that doubting mind, but, but don't let this go on forever. Right? Like you, you have to identify a, a, an aggressive, but achievable goal uh, and then go hit it. Um, I want to move on. Uh, you know, we could literally go on for, for hours on this, but I want to go on to the scale mindset. So the second stage after you after you start your business is, is you pass through some of those stage gates and you've now got hopefully a viable product with product market fit and maybe some funding behind it, uh, some customers and some revenue, and you're ready to now take it to the next level, which is the scale. And um, you make the point, Colin, that the vast majority of companies in America fail to scale. Um, you know, in many, in many ways, we live in South Florida, which is a scale up, but not a scale up. Uh, which is a startup, but not a scale up ecosystem. We're very good at starting businesses and not very good at scaling them. So um, talk to me about some of the mental challenges in that next phase where you have product market fit, you now have a team, you have some revenue, you have customers, and now you want to take it uh, and make it as big as possible. Yeah. Let me start with the number one reason why companies fail to scale. It's the entrepreneur. They are themselves in their own way. I love the slide at the beginning when you talked about different personality profiles. So I think if we're going to, and by the way, this is important in the start phase as well, but also becomes increasingly important in the scale phase. We need to understand who we are. Are we good at sales? Are we good at operations? I know in my case, I'm not good at sales. I've never been good at sales. I hate rejection. I'm not good at it. And so I always partner or hire those who are good at sales. Next, I also know I'm not a geek. I only aspire to be one. And then I love technology. I love the way technology transforms and changes the world. So what I do is I find uh, those who have those uh, CTOs who can help me build those companies. See, the first thing, the first step is to understand who you are. I love the DISC profile. And in the book, we talk about how DISC connects. Uh, I use the example of Star Trek. And uh, in the book, uh, you think of Captain Kirk, I'm talking about the first Star Trek here, the original. He, you know, his personality was dominant and also very influential, very social. You know, you think about um, Spock, who's very analytical, right? And Scotty, who's very stable, and and and, and um, uh, McCoy, sorry, McCoy is the stable one, and Scotty's the one who's the engineer as well. He's the analytical as well. But you think about the different personality types and how that team actually melds pretty well, and they're able to accomplish a lot. And I want you to think about it. I know that's fantasy, but I want you to think about it in your own terms. You want to be able to understand who you are, do your own profiling of yourself, profile everybody around you, profile people you're going to hire or bring onto your team. And that's the first step. Then I want you to think about scaling in zeros. This is a mentality. I learned this one from Jack Welch, actually. Jack Welch, he came up with this uh, saying, uh, hire people with runway. So if you're at a million dollars, we're going to want to hire people at who run companies at $10 million. Okay, and this is very important. Don't get too carried away. I've seen too many billionaire people who've worked at billion dollar companies try to work for a million dollar company and, and it's 99% of the time I see it blow up. It's very hard for someone to change the, their mentality in working in a larger company and go down that to that to that level. At the same time, if you're at a million dollar company and you're hiring people who have um, built million dollar companies and then they're the wrong people as well. We need to be thinking in zeros. And what do I mean? I mean, we need the people. We need how much money are we going to need to get to 10x our company? And what are the systems we need to put in place? You know, we entrepreneurs, we do things ad hoc. And in my case, I was doing it for up to about the age of 34, 35 years old. I mentioned that publicly traded company that we successfully sold. Well, it wasn't quite straight up. It was a roller coaster, okay? Back in 2006, 
the board began to move against me and I had a meeting with one board member who says, I think you're you're over your head, Colin. You can't you don't have what it takes to be the CEO of this company. I was CEO, I took the company public, everything. But the company had flatlined. And you know, we'd been running things very ad hoc. So I said to my um a friend I was talking about, and he goes, Well, you know, I want you to meet someone. And his name was Patrick Thien. He works. At, he runs a company called Rhythm Systems, very similar to EOS, very similar to Scale Up from Burn Harnish. He said, just talk to him. So I, met, I actually met him in Vegas, and he was like, well, you're going to need to do this. You need to do two days of strategic planning, 88 days of execution, goal setting, uh, weekly goal setting, daily sales huddles. I said, no, 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 no. I don't need that. I just got to get the board off my back, Okay. And you know what he says? He goes, okay, I'm not going to take you as a client. I say, so, so it's sort of like, you know, an overweight patient going to the doctor and saying, look, I don't want to do the lifestyle changes. I don't want to change my diet. I just, just give me the pill, right? No, you got to do the hard work. And so we started doing the hard work. And listen, this is a company that was public and was flatlining. Our, I, we had IPO at $6. We're trading down to $4.55, Okay. We brought in these systems. Oh, my gosh. It completely transformed the company. See, entrepreneurs, we do – one of the biggest problems is you get to a certain amount of success, and your ego takes over. Nothing could go wrong. You got us from here to there. Dan, you got us to this point. So why wouldn't I just keep trusting my instinct? Well, we had 600 employees, I and mean, we had to – set up systems, uh, value statements, everything. We brought it all into the company and the company tripled in size. That stock that's trading at $4.55 a share, we sold for ten fifty five dollars to a Fortune 500 company. And yeah, go ahead, Dan. You might be on the mute. Yeah, I wanted to jump in and, and give you two personal reflections on this. Um, so the first is a negative example. So... <clears throat> Um, one of the companies I worked for was a billion dollar energy company, uh, the largest Hispanic owned energy company in the country. A and it was founded by an Ernst and Young entrepreneur of the year and, uh, some of his friends and family members at his kitchen table with $10,000 in the bank. He was a former Enron employee, Enron imploded. He had an idea for going into the deregulated electricity markets across the country. There were 16 of them uh, nationwide, 16 states. And so he started this company with $10,000 in the bank and grew it to a billion dollars. And by the time I joined the company, um, I had profiled him when I was a journalist. And then after I lost my job, my first job uh, after losing my journalism job was to work for him. And I'm so grateful. Uh, to that company. But what was really, really apparent is that the tremendous entrepreneurial gifts that he had to roll up his sleeves and build a company from $10,000 to a billion dollars uh, were not the skills that he was going to need to take it from a billion to a multiple billion dollar company. And by the way, in the, in the, in the electricity business, uh, a billion dollars in revenue is not a lot of money because the margins are so tight. So it was a very small company in the energy context, uh, and the, they needed, a, and they were competing against the, you know, NRGs and the um, Florida Power and Lights of the world. So some of the largest companies there that you know that exist. And so, what I saw is that um, there's like a season for an entrepreneur, and some of us uh, are really only good at the startup phase, and we need to bring in like adult supervision slash professional managers for the scale phase. And you see this, uh, a great example is Google and bringing in, probably the most important thing they ever did was bringing in Eric Schmidt uh, so that Sergey Brin and Larry Page, who were startup founders, they were two grad students, uh, they brought in a professional manager to take it to the company it's become. Um, and not all founders are really the right fit for the scale phase. And so that's one example. The other example I wanted to give is my next company is I worked for a startup called uh, Offercraft and we sold uh, gamified marketing solutions. And 
uh, it was founded by one of my best friends, a guy named Aaron Ezra, and I would sit in on a lot of Aaron's sales calls. I've never seen a better salesman than Aaron. And one of the things that he did, which was so powerful, is he was always selling the company that we would be in six to 12 months. And he would describe the products, the services that we would have in six to 12 months. And then he would get people to buy into that. And then we would rush back and get the engineering team to build the software that we needed to in order to deliver that as promised. We had such a good uh, engineering team that we were always able to get the product delivered faster than our clients were able to get the paperwork process to get started with our engagement. And then, of course, the first couple months of an engagement or get to know you anyway. So it was almost as like just in time delivery. And we used the the roadmap. We used the what the customers were buying as our tech roadmap to, to fig, help us figure out uh, what what we sell, uh, what we should sell. So I often now remember that lesson, which is like, I don't talk about the little company I am today. Uh, I often talk about, or at least try to manifest the big company that I know I'm going to become. Um, and that has really helped me grow my company. And, and what I always do is you have to balance that with, the, it's a little bit of a tightrope, with making sure you can deliver on what you're promising. But, you know, you have a pretty good sense operationally of what your team is capable of doing and how fast they're capable of doing it. And just because the thing isn't built that you're talking about doesn't mean it can't be built in time. So how, how I live that forward today is I often, you know, I sell courses, right? And I sell personalized course experiences. So a lot of times I will go to a prospective prospect and I'll say, hey, we are going to offer X course. And that course I know is being built. In, 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 in that moment. And, but I know it'll be ready by the time they're ready to use it. So I basically sell them uh, vaporware, that piece of course that isn't, doesn't exist yet, but will, it, you know, you have to be careful because if you don't deliver on that, it can ruin a relationship and ruin your reputation. But it is also one of the tricks that I learned for how to scale a company. And in the case of Offercraft, we are able to grow from pre-revenue to a $3 million annualized run rate in under three years and an exit that was um, more than seven figures. Um, let's talk now about the next phase. Um, oh, before we do that, I, there's one thing, there's one mental shift that we need to make from start to scale. And it's very simple. In start, we delegate tasks. In scale, we delegate responsibilities, not tasks, okay? My wife and I own a school in Fort Lauderdale. She has 16 teachers and 70 parents and about 110 students in the school. And she's up almost every single night at three o'clock in the morning. I mean, how many of you who've started a business have been up at three o'clock in the morning? I know I've done that too many times in my life, okay? So when you begin to think about delegating responsibilities and not just, not just tasks, we're not just talking about nine to five. We're talking about 24 hours because an entrepreneur's mind never turns off. Okay, It never turns off. If I'm responsible for the email marketing or I'm responsible for the uh, uh, new customer acquisition for the school or whatever it is, if I'm responsible for it, then I'm going to be thinking about that all the time. See, it's, it's, it's not realistic to think that we can just be in – in charge of something or have responsibility uh, and not think about it outside of work. We're going to think about it. And that three o'clock in the morning moment has hit too many times. When you begin to delegate responsibility, not tasks, something magic happens. All of a sudden you begin to gain wealth and scale your organization. Now you're going to need to hire leaders and you're going to need to learn how to step back and coach your leaders and that's different from being that dominant person in start. So there is a transformation that you need to go through from start to scale. But I just want you to really think about that element. And we talk a lot about in the book, delegate responsibilities, not tasks. Yeah. You know, we uh, did an entire unit about Jim Collins' time, timeless lessons for small businesses. And this reminds me a lot of one of his great lessons 
uh, clock building versus time telling. So clock building, uh, time telling is delegating tasks. Asking someone, hey, what time is it? Oh, it's X time, great. Clock building is delegating responsibilities. You know, we need a way to consistently be able to figure out what time it is, go figure that out, right? And uh, what, what Jim Collins says is build a clock that will tell time long after you are gone versus just time telling right now. Uh, leading as a charismatic, uh, charismatic visionary, a genius with a thousand helpers is time telling and should be avoided. Shaping a culture that can thrive far beyond any single leader is clock building. So another way to, to phrase what you're saying, Colin, is, you know, inevitably you're in a time telling mode during the startup phase. But when you get to the scale phase, you need to get to the business of clock building. Um, okay. I'm going to share now um, my slides. Hang on. Yeah, it's, you know, when I did the session at MIT, it was four hours long. We're trying yeah. to condense it into a very short period of time, but but I like it. We're jumping. We're, we're going through it quickly. Yeah, you know, uh, we're going to um, just kind of pull out a couple threads. I mean, we could literally go for days on this, but um, I hope you guys are finding this of value. All right, so the next phase is you've started your business, you've scaled your business, you're ready to sell your business. And we wanted to talk about the exit mindset um, and, and the mental challenges that come uh, with exiting. Yeah, and I think that the first thing I'd, I'd, I'd recommend every entrepreneur do is, first of all, check your ego at the door. Okay, you're successful. Okay, you've done a great job. You know, I was in a, in a meeting about two years ago with a buyer of one of the companies, and we're going around, we're doing intros. So the CEO introduced himself, and others introduced themselves, and they came to me, and they said um, – and I introduced myself. I said, oh, I'm, I'm the chairman of the company. I'm the largest shareholder. Uh, and, and they, and, but they said, well, what do you do? And I said, well, I don't do anything. Well, what, what, of course, you know, I'm like a little duck in the water, paddling away, trying to get everybody to fix every, I, I play myself down. I play my people up. That's what we do because when I did sell my company, unfortunately I sold myself off to a fortune 500 company for three years. But during that time I got to acquire about 15 companies. And I learned the mentality at a Fortune 500 company. They're paranoid of entrepreneurs. They actually think entrepreneurs are kooky. By the way, the number of entrepreneurs that stay in a business after it's sold is very small. We're talking 10 to 20% after three years. So they know that. The smart buyers know this. So the more your business looks like it relies on a kooky entrepreneur that's going to leave anyway, the less value you're going to have in your company. So I want you to think about that upon exit. The other thing is why exit at all? And I will answer that question with bad things do happen. Let's look at 2022. We had the crypto crash. We had the tech wreck. We had a war start in Ukraine and we had a hurricane hit the West Coast of Florida. Now, why do I bring up these four things? And inflation hit. Oh, my gosh, inflation. Now, why do I bring up those five things? Because it hit every one of my companies. Every single one. Paw.com does 100 containers a year. They went from 2,000 to 24,000. We lost over $2 million in container costs that year. I have a number of properties that are located in the West Coast of Florida. I have 800 employees in Ukraine who do IT services. Bad things do happen, and, and that is the thesis of the book, that you do need to start, scale, exit, take some money off the table. By the way, it takes a lot of stress off of you as well. You know, if you can ultimately think, okay, well, I'm, I'm, I'm putting this money back into it, but I still have this. My, my kids' 529 plans have been maxed out. I don't have to worry about my kids for the rest of my life. I already have my home paid for. I have my second home. I have, When you begin to take money off the table, the stress – of, of, of going back to um, financial mediocrity, I'll call it, to going back to that stage, it's taken off the table, especially if you can diversify. So the last thing I'll say about exit, a lot of entrepreneurs, if you were to poll entrepreneurs after they sell the company, were they happier or not? They're generally not happier. They lose their identity. 
And this is a key point that when you begin to reframe the way you think of who you are, you are an entrepreneur and entrepreneurship is a trade like any other. And if you continue to learn, you'll gain from that learning and be able to repeat over and over again. You're not the CEO of one particular company. That is not who you are. That is not your identity. Your identity is one of entrepreneurship. I'm talking about professional identity. You may have other identities where you're doing philanthropy and you're doing uh, other hobbies and whatnot. But I'm talking about your professional identity. And when you begin to make that mind shift change, it, it opens you up to a lot of new opportunities. Now, it's scary. I'm jumping right away to repeat here. I know we're running out of time. But it's scary, the idea of starting another company. Especially don't, 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 don't jump to repeat, please. All right. All right. All right. You're the boss. Uh, you're we're right we're going to run long. Okay, got it. Got it. So sorry, I, I was um there's um there's a couple really good books um uh about the exit phase. Um that you know you should be so the first thing is when you're starting a business, you should be pretty clear about what your end goal is. So are you starting a business for it to be a business that essentially gives you a job? which is totally legit. They call that a lifestyle business. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. It's a little bit of a pejorative in Silicon Valley, but Silicon Valley people are very uh, odd people and I don't think they necessarily purvey the best uh, mindset when it comes to this stuff. So are you starting it to just give yourself and your family a job and give yourself a decent living? Totally legit, good to know. Um, are you looking to have your children or to have your employees run this business when you're uh, done. Because there, you know, there's one thing that is always for sure in business, which is you will not run the company forever. That is the one immutable fact of business. So if you're lucky enough to survive, you will have to hand it off in one form or another. And do you want maybe your employees to take it over or your own family to take it over? Uh, do you want to sell the company and then start another company? Um, or do you, um, you know, want to run the company for as long as you're able and then shut it down when you're not? All of those are legitimate and you need to have a point of view on that. And the reason why you need to have a point of view of that is because it will change how you build your company. Now, um, there's a great book that is really for the kind of start scale phase, which is called Built to Sell by John Warlow. And it's really about how do you build a company um, where you are not the essential part of it. So I think this is built to sell is really for people in the scale phase. Um, and then John Warlow wrote uh, another book, um, which I was looking for, but I couldn't find, um, uh, which is really about um, selling a company. And he's actually um, been making, uh, doing a lot of work um, uh, on uh, on the idea of um, preparing businesses to sell and stories uh, about selling uh, b business, um, which uh, the book is called The Art of Selling Your Business. And he has a podcast and a whole set of training about that. Because one of the things, and he's very right about this, is there are way more books about starting and scaling businesses than there are about exiting. Uh, there's another great book that I love, which is called Finish Big by Bo Burlingham. This is more of a journalistic book. He wrote another book called Small Giants that I love. Uh, but this book, Finish Big, was a series of interviews with people who had successful and unsuccessful exits. Um, and by the way, successful exit to him is not about money. It's about do you feel happier after you exit the business than you did while you were running it? And, and that's that's one of the hardest things for many entrepreneurs. I can't tell you how many entrepreneurs I've seen who are lost after they sell their business, just completely lost. They have no purpose in life. They are um, they often have a lot of money, but don't know what to do with it. And they've lost their professional purpose and meaning in their life. And it's been really, really hard on them. And so it's kind of weird uh, to me to devoutly wish for something that ends up making you so unhappy, but yet a lot of us do. Um, I've had personally a shift in my mentality about this. When I started BizHack, I started it as a business that I wanted to sell. And so I really found a lot of inspiration in the book Built to Sell. But one of the nice things about this book is if you build a business to sell, what you're really doing is you build a business that doesn't rely on you to operate. And if you can build a business like that, if you have a good team around you, then that gives you the freedom to then make a choice of whether you sell or you just live 
in the business as its owner um, and, and not have to work all the time in the business. I am nowhere near that in terms of my business. But one of the things that's evolved for me is I used to basically say, yes, I am building this company to actually eventually sell it. My, you know, typically it's like five to seven years. Everybody says the same thing. I want to sell it for, you know, $15 million. Uh, everybody sort of says the same thing. And it's kind of meaningless. But what I'm coming to realize personally is over the past year, I've come to find so much meaning in the work I do. And I've been finding that the work I'm doing is sort of scratching such a profound itch that I have in my life uh, for meaning and purpose, uh, what the Japanese call the ikigai. The ikigai is the intersection of what you love, what you're great at, what the world needs, and what you can make money doing. And I started to find my ikigai in BizHack, and I've come to realize, like, you know what, maybe this is just going to be the rest of my professional career. And like, I'm going to just like, this will be chapter two, I had a journalism chapter, and then a running biz hack chapter. And, and then maybe I'll just kind of see this through and then retire. And, and, and that's like totally legit. I, I don't need, like, it's a kind of personality driven business. I'm sort of the, you know, unique figurehead. It would be very, very hard to find someone to replace me. And maybe that's okay. Like maybe I can make money and do good and, and just, and that's good. Like maybe there is no exit for me uh, or the exit um, is going to just be to shut it down uh, when I'm ready. So I just want to ask you like for your reaction to that. I know we're trying to kind of be vulnerable, um, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm finding that though I do think that the framework of built to sell and having a company that you could sell if you chose to, um, which really means getting yourself out of the day to day and finding people smarter than you to run and operate the business. But I am starting to shift in terms of what my actual end goal is which is more at this point of a business that I can live in and enjoy and still have enough time for my family. Yeah, I think everyone goes through their own thought process, whether they not want to sell or not to sell. I know in the book, we talk about this in detail from an emotional side, but also from a, a tax side and from a financial side. There are a lot of reasons why you might want to consider selling just based simply on the tax rate. When we sold Hostopia in 2006, we had a 15% capital gains rate and our tax rate was um, 36 plus 15 for dividends. So we were paying 51% uh, tax rate. It would have taken us over 30 years to be able to recapture that. But that's not where we're going. With. We, we do talk a lot about in the book about why there's a lot of benefits to sell. Uh, but every everyone has to go through that process themselves. The fact of the matter is, what you pointed out here is that if it really is reliant on the owner, it reduces your ability to sell in the marketplace, and that is correct. If in K, if in if BizHack has six coaches, and or ten coaches or twenty five coaches, and you're killing it, and you can step aside, take a sabbatical. That's a, a set, that's a business you can sell. And so the question is, like, how much do you want to scale it? How do you want to scale it? Uh, and I know you're at the scaling phase right now. You've done very successful at getting it out of the gate. Now you're at the scaling phase. And I'm, I'm not I didn't mean to put you on the, on the as my subject in this particular show. It just you it kept going that way. We didn't plan on this, by the way, none of this stuff. But um, but the fact is. You have to go through that process yourself. How do you scale it so that you can exit the company? And how can it, it when you do scale it, can it have a bigger impact in the world versus just being yourself doing this? And that's that's something that you have to come to terms with on your own. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to interrupt real quick. Um, so I just launched the Net Promoter Score poll. Would would welcome your feedback. I'm seeing some folks in the chat saying that they appreciate the rawness and honesty, and I appreciate uh, you saying that. Um, this is a, a topic that's very dear to both of us, but also a little risky, right? Because most people don't talk about mentality and mental health publicly. So I would really love if you guys, before you run, because uh, I do know we're going to run a little long. I, I want to keep going with you, Colin, uh, if, if you have the time. Yeah. Uh, but I would really appreciate if you guys in the comments could just let us know how this is landing for you. Um, is this making any personal uh, sense to you? Is this resonating at all with any of you? Um, what are you getting out of this? If you could take a minute, please answer the poll. Um, only about half of you responded to that. And then also just let us know how 
how is this landing? Because um, uh, my sense is it, it, it's it's working for some of you and it's a good topic. Um, so uh, is there any other point uh, that, you know, that you wanted to make, Colin, about the, the exit? Part? No, we're good. We're good on the exit. Yeah. It's time to it's time to jump to entrepreneurship as a drug. Well, no, no, we have to do repeat. That's that's what it is. That's where I'm going. That's where oh, I'm going with it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Um, <laughs> yes. By the way, that's the whole uh, Jose, point. <laughs> one quick one quick note is when you're doing the uh, post edit, like this little segue, you can cut, uh, and then you can, and we'll just go to the next lesson. Make sense? Okay. Yeah, we're turning this into a little micro course uh, on business strategy, and awesome. really really excited to. Um, so let me get my slides uh, up. And uh, you guys will have access to the slides. There's there's a lot of notes in there that, uh, but honestly, the best thing you can do is read his book because uh, it's it really covers this uh, in tremendous detail. Okay, so you have started a company, you've scaled that company, you have exited that company, and now you're ready to do it all over again. Uh, you are uh, like Colin, a serial entrepreneur. Talk to me about the mental challenges of repeating. And um, I just wanted to start with one uh, quick concept, uh, which is called the sophomore slump. So um, this is a concept that's really big in um, uh, creative circles. And we talk about this a lot. Uh, you know, I have an MFA in creative writing. A lot of great authors will write an incredible first book. And then they have what's known as a sophomore slump. Sophomore, uh, you know, Canada, uh, Colin, you're from Canada. So uh, we can hear it somewhat, some, whenever you say the word about. Uh, about. Uh, but a sophomore is the second year. There's freshman year, then sophomore year. And the sophomore slump is like whenever you have a hit, it's usual that the next thing you do doesn't have as much success as the first. And this, um, the anxiety that people who've had big successes feel uh, and, and, and the mindset of fear of failure that comes after you've had an initial success is what we call the sophomore slump. And so one of the concepts that I know is really big in the um, the repeat phase is there, there often can be almost more fear of, of failure after you've had a success and you're trying to repeat it than when uh, you, you did it for the first time because there is a sense that um, maybe the first time you just were lucky. That's it. And I've seen and worked with so many entrepreneurs who've had that big success and they never want to go back. It's a bit like that scene in the Matrix. And if you remember that movie, it's a bit old here. But where the guy says, I just want to go back to the Matrix. The meat just tastes too good. I don't want to live this. This is just it's too stressful to be out in this world. You know, a lot of entrepreneurs, they do hit that certain point. And then and and by the way, every this is not a judgmental thing. This is something that, again, like exit, whether choosing to exit or not, whether choosing to repeat or not. This is all about you making a decision as to what you want to do next. And many entrepreneurs, for whatever reason, they they, they never get back in the ring. And it could be the fear of mediocrity. It could be the sleepless nights, the three o'clock in the morning, the relationship issues. It could be all of those combined. And why do you want to go back to that when you've got enough, enough economic wealth to enjoy the rest of your life? And so I sort of asked that question in the book, and, and I even used the example of Alfred Hitchcock, who did the movie Psycho, and how he put – I mean, here he is, a storied career. Nobody wants to take this movie. He says, I don't care. I believe in it. Let's like what Dan was saying. I believe in it. I believe it's going to be great. He's going down this path. Never done a horror like this before in his life. Put all his money into it. Had to fire all his staff, like all of his residential staff, everything. Here he was. He's totally out of money after, after a very successful career. He put it all on the line one more time. And he put it on Psycho. And, of course, it hit. And he became very successful and very wealthy after that movie. Entrepreneurship is like a drug. Drug. It's like akin to a blackjack player going for another hit. And I know that's the case in my in my case. In the book, we profile a gentleman who has bought over a thousand homes in Fort Lauderdale, and he tells me he cannot stop. 
He just keeps buying. Every time he buys, it's like another, it's like another hit. So there is something that a, a number of us have where there is an addictive component to this. And sometimes addiction can go wrong. So just bear with me for a minute here. I wanted to read this. Entrepreneurship, entrepreneurs, sorry, including myself, live on the edge. We have extreme personalities and we constantly, constantly need to get the fix. The high that comes from closing a deal, launching a new product, registering a domain name, or making the next million. Like any addiction, it could be dangerous. And it not only impacts us, but all those around us. I mentioned a good friend of mine, Goran Dragoslavic, and how he purchased over a thousand homes. Most serial entrepreneurs are no different, including myself. Entrepreneurship is a drug. We also need to find ways with coping with the roller coaster ride, the ups and downs, the failures and successes. The first thing I will say is that you are not alone, although sometimes it feels like it. And I understand that you can't always have talks with your friends and family about where you're go what you're going through because maybe they just don't get it. But you can connect with others in a deep and meaningful way. And, and Dan and I belong to an organization called EO. This is one of those organizations where you can connect. Every month, I meet with seven other individuals and share my personal, family, and business issues in a safe and non-judgmental group. My EO group has seen and helped me every step of the way throughout my startup career since I joined in 1996. From every new business plan to improving my pitch the day before my IPO to helping me exit a number of companies. Beyond these efforts, my forum has done more to support me as a human being. In 2017, my forum confronted me about my life. See, at that time I was successful, but I was also, like Dan said, a workaholic. I'm one of those, okay? My entire identity was based on my companies. And I was ignoring other areas of my life. Sorry, my phone just rang. Thankfully, my family stuck through the challenges and continued to support me. But I had let my health deteriorate, traveled way too much, uh, drank a little too much wine to numb the stress, and continued to work day and night on my businesses. Look, it's not easy. And when we reach out and get help from others... That's not vulnerability. It's a sign of strength. In our incubator, we have over 10 companies that I'm a principal shareholder in. And the CEOs who come to me admit errors or faults or issues or need help, they're the ones who are the stronger CEOs. The ones that think they know it all and I don't talk to for a month or two, I know I got a problem with that CEO. It's a sign of strength. The way that Dan was vulnerable today, that's a sign of strength. And I think that when we begin to understand that and we begin to reach out and get others to help us, and by the way, we help others too, then we become much stronger entrepreneurs and we can repeat over and over again. I will say the older you get, in some ways, the harder it is. When you're 20-something, you don't have the relationship, the kids, the responsibilities, and all of that kind of stuff. It, it You know, it, you can just sort of throw it out there, and if, you, if it all screws up, you start over again in a couple of years. But you can't start over again at the age of 50 or even the age of 40, right? Maybe even the age of 30. So at that point, the responsibilities begin to kick in. So it does become more challenging. But one thing I do want to say is that when you – are on this roller coaster, your family doesn't have to go through the emotional strain and challenges that you go through. So I would often come home. This happened years ago, and I had to go through. I had to meet a psychologist um, to deal with this. Dan, I would come home and I would talk to my family, my wife and my kids, like I would my employees. And at the office, by the way, I have not changed my style at the office. I'm staccato. It's like, okay, I need you to do this, 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 this. Sometimes the employees are like, I walk in the office, like, I need this done, this done, this done, this done. This. So I would get home and I'd say, I need this done, this done, this done, do that. Do and it, and it, it made, I had to come to terms with the fact that I was pulling 
my family onto that roller coaster and I was treating them like they were employees. And I had to come up with a routine. So what I ended up settling on, which is my favorite routine, is I come home now, I actually have a hot tub and I go into the hot tub and I transform from this business, da, 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 you know, high intensity, that whole, you know, that whole personality that I that I that I that I have to almost a completely different personality. And I'm not saying we shouldn't share challenges with our loved ones because sometimes that helps as well. I know in my particular case, I tend to try to shield them from a lot of the roller coaster, the ups and the downs. I think that's a personal choice and that maybe is the wrong choice. I'm actually putting that out there. But then what I do is I share those that roller coaster with people like Dan, with friends uh, it, it, friends that I know, with people in my EO group. So I, I do believe in reaching out and, and sharing. And I'm going to leave you with a statistic here. We interviewed Bridget Weston. Bridget Weston runs an organization called SCORE. They have 10,000 volunteers. It's funded by the SBA, the Small Business Administration. They make a claim that you can increase your chances of success by three times if you get a mentor. Their services are free. Today, we talked a lot about incubators, mentors, uh, 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 friends, EO, entrepreneurs organization, uh, those kind of things. They are free. You just have to reach out and connect and, ch and increase your chances of success, but also deal with some of the mental challenges of what it's like to be on that roller coaster. Beautiful. Um, we have one question from the audience that I wanted to take some time to, to answer, and then we're going to do uh, some closeout. Lynn McComas asked, so how do you find that ever important person, or I would say people, that is smarter than you to bring on? Yeah. So the first thing is I'm going to go back to profiling. Once you profile yourself, and you understand the roles and positions that you need to hire in your organization, you're gonna to wanna to lay out what kind of profile would you have for that individual? For instance, if we're gonna hire a sales manager or a sales leader, we're gonna to wanna to hire someone who's got dominant personality, but also who can actually sell. They can be your lead salesperson. Now, I don't wanna get, when you're smaller, that's what we're going to go. We're going to tend to go for a DI. If you're getting into a much larger sales force, we sometimes look at a DS, and that's the DISC model I'm talking about right now. Uh, DS, dominant and steady, right? Someone who can actually run a sales force. But for the most part, we want a, a DI to lead our sales force. But if we're the DI, we don't need uh, to hire that DI. We might want to hire the operator. I know a lot of great entrepreneurs. And by the way, I, I don't have an exact statistic on this one, but the vast majority of successful entrepreneurs are DIs. They're dominant and influential. They're good. They're they're, they're pushy and and good at sales. Uh, if you look at some of the more successful ones, they're DCs like myself, who are who are dominant and analytical, uh, like Bill Gates. Uh, his personality. Uh, uh, Steve Jobs had that personality. Um, Elon Musk has that personality type. And what they do is when you become analytical, you begin to realize, oh, I just need to hire out. Well, you don't need to be a DI or DC to know. You just need to hire out your weaknesses. You just need everybody just needs to know that. And once you understand that, you can begin to do that. Then again, we want to hire people who have runway. If we've taken the company to a million, but we've never gone beyond a million, we want to hire the smart people who have taken it to 10 million, uh, their companies, and they're going to help guide us through. It's a lot easier if they've been through the path before for them to guide you through that to the next level. So I think those are two things. Think about personality. Of course, you're going to want to look at skill set as well. If you, you need to, to um, hire people with different skill sets than your own. But don't do what a lot of entrepreneurs do right out of college. A couple of buddies, they just get together and they say, let's launch a business. A pile of buddies to come together. I, I was involved in a company like that I invested in, unfortunately. It was my nephew's company. I shouldn't even say that. They got to $12 million selling jewelry. There were five business partners. They rented out, they were made up, they were so successful, they rented out the suite in Vegas that was in that movie, you know, with the tigers and 
the whole thing it was just insane they they were they were living the rock star lifestyle i mean you could almost write the story on this the script on this one but they didn't compliment each other at all and the company imploded went in, into bankruptcy a year later what's fascinating is all five of them have separated and they're all very successful to get disaster they didn't compliment each other whatsoever separate they became very successful and i think that's fascinating so I, I had a personal question on this front um i have been kind of unsuccessfully ever since i read the book just to kind of go full circle uh rocket fuel and learned that i'm a visionary and i need an integrator an operational person to be my counterbalance um, I have attempted uh, and failed to find that person. Um, and uh, I wondered, um, do you have any advice for me? Because uh, I'm going to go actually, I literally yesterday night uh, put on the very top of my uh, my uh, to-do list. Here's my to-do list. Uh, uh, you know, hire uh, someone to help with operations. Um, so I'm like kind of going back out again because I like, when I don't have that person, I am very often reminded how badly I need that person. But the only thing worse to not having that person is having the wrong person in the role. And so I've kind of 0 for 2, and I'm a little nervous about it. Uh, what advice would you give me, uh, just practical uh, advice would you give me to helping find uh, the right uh, operational support to my visionary yeah, uh, so I, you I, know, I, role? Okay, again, I think that you're going to want to say, okay, what is this person's role and what personality profile would work well for this person? So if you're trying to stick somebody into that role and they don't have the right personality profile, in this case, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to go at a little bit. I'm going to, I'm going to, if you know the disc profile, I saw you had that earlier. I'm, I'm leaning towards a DS profile. If you could find somebody with DS profile, that's great. One of the challenges for hiring leaders that have dominant instinct is they tend not to be on the market. They tend to be running companies. They tend to be entrepreneurs. Sometimes, by the way, they can be ex-entrepreneurs and you can actually partner with them because you know they sold their company. They're looking for something else to do. They were really good at building a company and handling the operational side of a company, but not good at the, the sales, you're, you're a DI. Uh, I, I think, I believe, right? So you, they're not as good at that element as they are at the uh, um, at at what they do. So sometimes you can actually hire ex, uh, ex entrepreneurs who've sold their company. Now, what we do in the book, we talk about this a lot, is we track our A players. And we don't hire directly from our prior companies. I think that's, there's, there's issues with it. I believe that violates integrity over money, which is one of my values, never to do that. Um, but I do track them. And when you sell a company, more often than not, they do leave. I'm working with a company right now, Dan. This is unbelievable. The guy was a CTO. He's making $250,000 a year. The company that I'm working with had flatlined, had $3 million in debt. And... He'd worked for me in, in 2000 for about eight years, nine years before we sold the company. He stayed on for another eight years after that. We hired him for $120,000. He went from 250 to 120, and we gave him 10% of the company in options, but we gave him 10% of the company. And, that, and he loves it. And by the way, fast forward a year later, the company's up 80% growth rate in one year in revenue. And this is a recurring revenue business. It's phenomenal when you begin to plug those positions in, how it can make such a huge difference in your business, whether it's a different personality profile or different skills or both, generally both. We want to find, if we need a CTO, we need to find that CTO. We need an operator, we need to find that operator. When you plug that in, it's just, it's amazing to see what you can do with your organization and your company and how fast you can grow it. You know, it's it's like I'm very aware of my limitations at this point, having been through all these assessments and really done the hard work over many years to like do that self analysis and see myself coming. Um, what's hard? What, what like you can you can know who you are, 
but that doesn't necessarily mean, and you can know who you need, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're good at finding and hiring that person. So um, one of the pieces of feedback I've gotten from one of my mentors, and I actually have many mentors, but one of the pieces of feedback is that you're not very good at hiring. Um, because one of the things that I tend to do is I just, um, I grab at talent that's that's near and I'll just like whatever's available, I'll go versus defining the role, doing a sort of strict process. Um, and I realize why I do this. Um, I have a fast mind um, and I'm capable of doing a lot of different things. You know, I started out at, at Princeton University as a mechanical engineer. Uh, I ended up studying uh, the humanities, uh, was an acting journalist and ended up getting a degree in public policy with a minor in Spanish. So the point is I can do a lot of different things. Uh, I'm equally good at math and writing. Um, and that's actually been, obviously it's a great skill, but it's also been an albatross because in my own business, I can do almost any role if I set my mind to it. Should I be? No. And so I sort of often assume, hey, you know, these people I'm looking to hire are equally able to do anything if they set their mind to it. They're great people. They're really smart. And that's just not true. And so, um, you know, you know, an owner's strengths is 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 her company's weakness. Uh, I am definitely an example of that. So let's wrap up. Um, this has been everything uh, I hope for and more. Uh, thank you for uh, sharing uh, your wisdom, your lessons. Uh, thank you for the counseling. Uh, I wanted to invite you. Um, there's a quote that you have from your book that we'll have you read here in a sec, but. Before we do that, we always ask our our our, um, our guest instructors, what was an aha from today uh, or from this experience that we've been doing together um, that uh, made you maybe think about this topic in a slightly different way, uh, or 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 that was like your biggest like realization from today? Sorry, Dan, are you asking? You're not asking me, are you? Yeah, I'm asking you. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were asking. I thought you had some guest uh, moderate. Okay, so for me, uh, it's it was really when you first started talking to me about the book and how it really does address a lot of the emotional and mental challenges of starting, scaling, exiting, repeating. And then as we went through it today, you're talking about yourself just i never expected that and that's a sign of strength again i'm coming back to that because the way that you were able to frame you know this is where i'm at what can i do to get to that next level i think that is you're operating at a point a level that few entrepreneurs get to and by operating at that level, you're going to be able to solve those challenges. You're going to be able to get the right advice. You're going to connect with the right community so that you can actually take your business to the next level. And that openness and honesty, I, I, I it's rare that I come across a, a an interviewer who delivers such an authentic presentation like you did today. Um. Wow. Uh, I'm going to let, you know, another thing we say in improv is let that blow land. And the idea is you, you just take it in, you know, like we all get a little embarrassed when you're praised and the tendency is to say, oh no, but I'm going to let that blow land. Thank you. Thank you for that. Absolutely. Um, I wanted to share a quick uh, reflection. Um, I've been thinking a lot about this as I prepare for my congressional testimony on Tuesday. So I want to back up to when, uh, and then and then th there's this beautiful quote uh, about your title not being CEO. I'm going to have you read that in a second, then we'll wrap up. But um, so as I prepare for my congressional testimony, I've been thinking a lot about my entrepreneurial journey, and I remember back to COVID uh, in March of 2020. And um, those of you who've known me for a while know that BizHack back then was an in-person training company. We trained at CIC Miami. Uh, all of our training was done in person. And the day that COVID shut us down, uh, we had to cancel our entire year's worth of programming. And it was pretty clear that this wasn't going to be a short-term shutdown, uh, even from the beginning. Uh, we, were, we did have a class in session that we were able to quickly convert to Zoom. I think that took about an hour. We were prepared for that. 
uh, we had been moving towards that. So turning it from a in-person to a Zoom wasn't the issue. The bigger issue was all of the classes that we had coming up uh, were, um, were supposed to be in person. And so we had this difficult series of conversations with everyone who we collected money from where we asked, offered them a full refund because we knew that there is a chance that we were not going to be uh, hosting it in person. And, and, you know, I personally made all of those phone calls and saw basically my bank account dwindle to nothing. Um, and, uh, and we were feverishly working like ducks on a pond trying to like convert the, you know, convert our, what had been in-person classes into online classes which is something we were preparing for, but it's not a small task. And so while we were working met feverishly on that with a very small team, my team came to me and they said, Dan, you need to get out there and start sharing with people what you and the other instructors know about how to survive and thrive in a crisis. And I said, that's nice, that's good to hear, but we can't, there's no way uh, while we're trying to reinvent the company that we have the time to do that. And they said, there's no option but to do it. And I remember getting on the phone on a Friday afternoon before we launched our first masterclass. And I said to my team, are you guys sure? Because this is going to be a ton of work. I've done this for my whole career. This is not a small thing. And they said, yes, Dan, we got to do this. We have got to do this. And I said, like, it was, you know, Lilia Posos. I'm like, Lilia, I don't know if I'm going to be able to pay you. She's like, Dan, you'll figure it out. We got to do this. People need us. And I remember I went out in that first masterclass and I was fucked up in the head like all of us were. Like my company was failing. Uh, I didn't know if I could make payroll. Uh, and yet here I am trying to pretend that I know what I'm talking about and bringing in experts uh, to, to help uh, guide uh, and provide whatever insight we could. And we did 60 of those every week without fail no funding, never charging, and won multiple national awards for cause marketing for that work. It got the attention of the county and they started funding us. And that's how this series began. A, a year and a half to two years of just giving, 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 giving. About a month or so into that, the Black Lives Matter movement like really got going. And there is this moment when um, all the big brands put like a black thing on their Twitter accounts. They, it, it was kind of like the idea was like, we're going to stop talking and give space for black folks to, to, to have the floor, to have the stage. And I just remember feeling like the whole thing was kind of dumb. Uh, you know, I remember like Taco Bell you know, blacked out their logo. And then they're like, you know, we support Black Lives Matter, buy more chalupas. And it just felt inauthentic. Um, so I, I stayed silent. And uh, I got a call from one of my coaches, you know, about uh, half of our coaches are either women or or BIPOC. Um, and one of my, my one of my black uh, female coaches called me and she said, Dan, your silence is deafening. I said, what do you mean? She said, look, either you're with us or you're against us. Either you believe in, uh, you know, equal treatment of black folk or you don't. Uh, and I'm like, well, look, like I'm a white guy. What do I have to say about this? Yes, I'm the son of an immigrant. Yes, my dad came here from Spain. Yes, I'm bilingual and binational. Yes, I am a, a minority owned business uh, in, in the state of Florida and proud of my Hispanic identity. But look, I'm also a white guy. I'm the son of privilege. I grew up in a nice suburb of Philadelphia. I went to really great public schools and then went on to Princeton. I have two master's degrees. I'm like, I'm like, what do I have to say? And she says, we just need to hear you say that you love and support us. So I said, that's not enough. I need to do something about this. So I spent the whole weekend just perseverating and thinking about this, taking long walks on the beach and trying to figure out what the heck I was going to do about this because I knew she was right. I had been a journalist my whole career, and I was very reluctant to step into the political ring and to say something that I thought could alienate some of my coaches. You know, I have I live in Miami. There's a lot of conservative people here. I had several uh, Republican Cuban coaches who are some of my favorite and most uh, cherished uh, colleagues. I, I didn't want to say anything to offend them. And I and I realized, like, look, this is a human rights issue. I'm not a journalist anymore. And I made a decision 
to take a stand in favor of minority owned, underserved, BIPOC, black businesses. And I, I said it publicly, but I did one other thing is, is I launched a scholarship fund, self-funded again at a time when we had no money. And I said, we are going to offer massive discounts to any BIPOC or women owned business uh, to take our courses. And we uh, launched that scholarship program and uh, it has been running now for uh, three and a half years. We've given out more than $300,000 in scholarships to more than 150 BIPOC and women owned businesses. And now we have the county helping support us to, and every dollar the county gives, I personally, we BizHack match that fund. Um, and the, the reason I wanted to share this story is because what I've learned through doing a hundred of these is that vulnerability is strength. And that when you are vulnerable, people respond to it with love and people appreciate someone who's being real. And, and I don't have all the answers, nor do I pretend to, but I come at this with such humility and, and I've learned that if I just am honest about what I don't know and what I'm struggling with, people find inspiration in that. So thank you for seeing me, uh, Colin, so clearly uh, and allowing me the space to be vulnerable and making me feel so safe in doing so. Absolutely. So you have a beautiful closing quote. Yeah, and I and I mentioned this before that and this is the last line of the book. Always remember your title is not CEO, co-founder or executive. It's always entrepreneur. That is the job. Entrepreneurship is a trade like any other, and continuous learning is the key to achieve better and better results. BizHack is an example of that, where you can continually learn and improve your trade. We need to learn how to master our trade, the trade of entrepreneurship. Thank you so much, Colin C. Campbell. Appreciate you. Absolutely. Uh, so we'll be back here in one week's time. We're going to be talking about the X Factor with Barrett Ursek. The X Factor is a concept out of the book Scaling Up by Vern Harnish. And then we're going to talk about one of the hardest things for all businesses, financial planning that drives growth with Eric Cruz. Thank you so much for the extra time today, Colin. Thanks, everybody, for sticking around to the end. And we'll see you guys back here in one week's time. Absolutely. And you'll enjoy the X Factor as well, because that is something that uh, can really grow your business. And I had the opportunity to interview him twice for the book, Start, Scale, Exit, Repeat. Thank you very much, Dan. Really enjoyed it. We'll see you soon. Bye, everybody.